Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name's Yi Fong, and with me are my co-host Bob and Lily. Greetings. Hello. Hey guys, what's up? We're all super tired, so we're gonna <laughs> go straight into the movie itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little bit. Yeah. So this this um week uh it and what we're about is we uh we'll watch a silent movie and a series of shorts, and we kind of just talk about it. That's pretty much all we're about. This week we're going to talk about a Robert Wien film from 1923 called. Raskolnikov. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but I think um, it's Raskolnikov. Okay. It's based on the uh, the Dostoevsky's uh, novel *Crime and Punishment* from 1866, and um, this is the, far as we know, the initial, the first film adaptation that we are aware of for that book. And of course, subsequent to that, there's been many other TV movie adaptations. Ever since it's one of those popular works of art that people like to adapt into film medium or, you know, TV movie medium. So, um, so let's get right into it. The, the, the overall plot is essentially, uh, you know, a guy who kind of, um, uh, is cornered into poverty and, Basically needs to steal some money, but in the process of stealing it, uh, gets rid of, uh, kills a couple of people, and then at the end of the day, the uh, guilt of the murders uh, is basically eating him up until the final uh, scene where he confesses the crime. High level. <laughs> the novel, I'm sure, is a lot more sophisticated and complicated. I've never read it, but I just know that uh, it's, I'm sure it's a uh, goes into the weeds, as it were, inside baseball, right? <laughs> No. Yeah, I wondered if I forgot. I couldn't remember if at one point, like just in schooling history, that you would have to have read *Crime and Punishment* in high school. I mean, I certainly didn't, but I know of the story of Dostoevsky writing it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> required reading. I found isn't quite standard across um, education everywhere. I, I feel like you know. Like, you sometimes think like, well, you you've certainly have had to read those certain works, and oh, it's not yes. very common. I don't think I, it, it's I don't know. I, it just feels like it's less and less common that people have a shared literary knowledge uh, or foundation. Sometimes it is, but more often than not, I find that it's not always the case. Did you have to read this, Bob? This no. particular, yeah, <clears throat> I didn't no, have to read I, but, it. But but, no. but I mean, I think everyone has heard of. It. It's like War and Peace, Crime and Punishment, yeah. but honestly, I don't even know if War and Peace is by the same author. I feel That's like it... uh, Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy. Oh, okay, Tolstoy. Yeah. yeah. He's Russian. <laughs> One of those, right? <laughs> One of them guys. Yeah. So let's jump into it. What do you guys think of this particular... Uh... First of all, the I'm going to put this in the show notes. Or... I'm going to put this in show notes, but the, the link to the YouTube copy is pretty poor. It's essentially... I think it's like somebody's video camera or phone recording of a, a mm-hmm. film screening or something like that. So the colors are washed out and stuff like that. There's a um, lot of scent to burn, yeah. Yeah, so... It, was, it made it harder to understand the movie Oh, absolutely. Well. It's just, it, But unfortunately, like, if you look around, that's essentially the only copy we have. There's really yeah. nothing else available, which is kind of the state of silent films, right? You just kind of have to roll with the punches of you can only get what you can get at this point. So, anyways, we're lucky to just You'll have take anything. Those scraps and love them. That's that's as good as we get. <laughs> so, uh, having said all that, um, like for example, the letter writing scenes, I just couldn't make out a no, big chunk of it in the beginning. Anything. Yeah, yep. which is funny because they try to stylize it. Might as well. I, I wish they just printed it so that you could actually figure out what, what it was said. But, um, all right, so overall, what do you think, Bob? I liked it. I liked it. I, I was, um, I mean, in, in college, I, I studied a lot of philosophy, and I, I really love philosophy. And uh, he seemed like, the guy seemed to be portrayed as, like, a deep thinker, frustrated and depressed, but still seemed like, you know, the way they were depl- depl- dep- um, portraying him was he had these philosophical thoughts about justified killing justified murder 
later in the film, they, they actually put it forth to him and questioned him. The investigator questioned him on it and said, did you write this? And it was a paper about him saying that it would would it, would it be right in the eyes of God, you know, to eliminate those, and he used the word, pests from society who were a drain on society morally, um, as long as one didn't become obsessed with it, ob obsessive about it. So it was intriguing um, that he would contemplate that. And when he went to the pawnbroker, it seemed to me that his intention was not to rob the pawnbroker, but to kill the pawnbroker. Because right. he thought the pawnbroker was doing evil. Right. Because he, he overheard the conversation from other people. Yep. Right. He, he That conversation by the other people um, made, made the pawnbroker a target, even though he had already dealt with her. Um, but it seemed like when he, after he killed her, that the robbing her, it almost seemed like an afterthought, like, hmm, wow, she has money here, you know? Right. Hmm, very interesting. One thing, I i mean, well, the star, I didn't even know the pawnbroker was a woman. Yeah. I oh, thought yeah, that was hard kind of... to make out, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just Talk about it ugly. Was, <laughs> yeah, pretty ugly. I just thought it was Forgive a scraggly old guy. Forgive me for saying so, but very ugly. <laughs> Well, it surprised me as well because I feel like that's not a job a woman might have done. I mean, I obviously right. don't know the context, but you always just assume those types of jobs are held by men. Exactly. So when I'm reading the intertitle cards and it's a her, I'm just like, wait, who? What? You know what I mean? So that was very interesting. Yeah, I agree. That threw me as well. Hmm. Um. Yeah, so like I, uh, I, I, uh, the for me the probably just the, the the start towards the beginning when the main character, uh, uh, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> Russ, I have a hard time I, pronouncing his name. I called him Roscoe for short. Roscoe, <laughs> there, there you go. So Roscoe guy here. Uh, well, according to the plot for because I hadn't read it, so I just read the Wikipedia plot. It, he's yeah, a you former. Have to. Yeah, so he's a former law student. And so he's living in extreme poverty in a rented uh, room in this uh, setting uh, in St. Petersburg. And so he's isolated and antisocial, and, and he was in school, but he's not in school anymore. So he's kind of by himself, and he's kind of become a loner, and, uh, and he just uh, uh, kind of is in his head so much that he is unable to, to support himself. And so... Um, I think he was already kind of uh, brooding and scheming of ways of premeditated murder. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is because of his experience with law and he's able to kind of, I guess, uh, make his defense or get, sort of uh, think he, his way through the perfect crime type of ordeal because yeah, of his experience. Yeah, he's able to understand it. So what what part of the movie that I was super confused by was the letter that he received. So in in the actual uh, novel itself, it explains a lot more of the backstory. So then I understood what was going on more. So what happened was, it's basically, and I I I I I did understand there was something was going on with his mother and his sister, and I, I just couldn't get the details. But in the in the novel, basically, it's saying that uh, Roscoe, the main character, received a letter from his mother saying that uh, his sister has been working as a, with a, I don't know what a governess is, but there's a, with an employer, and apparently uh, in order to help the whole family out, his sister has chosen to marry this, uh, a, a suitor, basically. And so, basically she's forced to marry in order to just, uh, stay financially stable, basically, and so that really um, messed him up because he was basically saying, and, and basically in the letter, the mother saying that uh, this other character, suitor person, is taking advantage of the situation, you know, and so he's really pissed at the fact that his sister has to make a sacrifice for uh, the whole family when he himself really didn't do anything to help them if, if anything he kind of blames himself i think at least i'm reading it between the lines of 
putting the whole family in that predicament, you know what I mean? Of being in poverty, the whole family, and he's not kind of winning, you know, the bread, the dough, and all that stuff. Okay, that makes sense, because he was a school student. Yeah. Or a former law student. Yeah, if law school costs a lot of money, I'm sure, even back then. So, yeah, that is an interesting concept. Also, yeah, I think having that context allows bad. allows me to f- place the character where where he is and also gives him the motive. And that's why in the beginning, it, it, the plot detail, I think some of the intertitles basically saying he's devising, even before he heard uh, other people talking about how the Palm Burger wasn't um, morally righteous and all that stuff. He, he, he had already been planning it way before anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it does a good job of illustrating him going from a, a sort of cerebral, thinking it through, but then a target presents itself, which right. he goes from the the philosophical to the reality. Exactly. That's a whole different world when he realizes there's guilt involved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, I'm guilty. <laughs> and and the part of there's again the copy of the film that we watch was so uh, grainy and blocky and blotchy yeah. and the color is just it, the definition was not great, but I couldn't make out a lot of these details, but. Reading the synopsis of the, the the novel actually clarifies a few things. Yeah. Like in the beginning, he's like in the movie, you could see he, was, he ripped apart his shirt and he was doing something and I just couldn't see what was going on. But apparently the plot is that he steals an axe and makes his way once more back to the palm broker and gains access saying that has something to pawn. Of course, I, I think previously he said he had a cigarette. Um, yeah, silver metal. cigarette case. Yeah, and so he wraps something up that may or may not be a cigarette case. That's what he was doing when he was wrapping it up. And the reason he wrapped it up with so many wraps of clothes is so she gets distracted by it, trying right. to unwrap the thing. So yep. it took me a few tries to figure that plot detail out. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so... You know, he ends up killing her, and uh, I, I somehow the scene cuts out. I don't know if there was a more brutal yeah, film the, the, scene. The, 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 yeah, it was the, very jump cutty. Right, but well, I know was, that probably guess, was an on error in the film. There was a there was a damage to the film. Obviously, it turns to a right. black screen, red screen kind of thing. But yeah, he kills the the sister. Right, and that apparently this the the so there's it's the pawn broker character but then there's also uh uh her half sister is very detailed <laughs> Inter- is, uh... interrupts him in the in the act yeah, yeah. exactly now and she so... must die yeah because she's seen his face yeah but i feel like this is where robert Wayne, the director is kind of in his element when right after the crime is committed he he uh you know tries to escape the the floor that he's on and he's trying to evade uh, all the different commoners trying to check in on the welfare mm. of the pawnbroker. I just feel yeah, like that entire is, good suspense. Yeah, like that's kind of right up the Robert Wien's alley. I mean that you know as we yeah. said in previous podcasts, he he tends to kind of live in the shadows of the deep psyches and the, mm-hmm. the guilts and sort of. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say that he he. The, the sets are very similar to the last film we watched uh, right. with the very he, it, I thought of a neat thing analysis today which I I didn't re- I realized was it looks like a a Dr. Seuss setting put to life right. <laughs> oh yes absolutely <laughs> with everything uh, at odd angles so I mean the director clearly likes subjects of sanity or insanity I mean right and reality and stuff like that yeah. versus dreams versus any of those things. Yep. But also, yeah. yeah, my favorite part of the film was that the, it it kind of it kind of shows that he goes from you know, thinking about it is very different from doing it. Right. It was their modern day thriller, so it makes a lot of sense. I, mean, I, right. I think I know very few people who haven't contemplated. Like uh, that, that, that wish that someone would die, <laughs> which is a terrible evil thought, but it felt like so many of my friends have expressed it. And I was like, 
it's part, of, part of being human. It's part of being human. Yeah. 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 But also is part that... of being human is that if you actually kill someone, you're yeah. gonna be you're gonna be filled with grief about it. Yeah. It's like, you know, if only that problem X, whatever it is, goes away, everything would be a lot better. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but removing X causes, you know, Y, Z, and whatever the subsequent right. stuff came comes along, especially the whole eating into your sort of psyche and your moral blah, blah, blah. And so, like, yeah, and, and there's, a, there's a side uh, story with him and a guy he meets in, I guess, the bar, at least in, in the movie, and his friend who's sort of... Uh, just drinking his days away is yeah. in some ways similar to him in some ways is like he's not taking of his family as well he's just being a drunk and then his daughter has to be basically a prostitute is kind of the that's what it is yeah. in a novel when he starts confessing so. to him at the bar i thought oh boy this guy's like marking himself as the first target you know right right exactly but it doesn't turn out that way it doesn't he doesn't take it roscoe doesn't take it as he he's the one causing the pain it's someone's causing his pain right you know so essentially it's it's the whole thing is in six parts so the the actual book itself goes in way more detail way more plot way more sort of back and forth it feels obviously it's you know based on a novel which in which the novel is a lot more uh i don't know like the it's a lot more it tells like a complete story. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Where the film, we're getting bits and pieces. I could tell that between the six parts. You know, yeah. the first part is there. The second part's there. The third part, not as much. And then right. the, as it just goes on and on. Exactly. Because it's a book. Exactly. They have more time to spend telling you the story where the film's only an hour. Right. And I'm sure the book's going to take you more than an hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But I was going to comment on you know, I personally couldn't get into the film once again because of the way it was, the the copy we watched. But now that we're talking about it, the way it, – it is very fitting for this film because of the German expressionism, like dealing with the psyche and – I don't know. It's. I feel like it's a good film for Robert Wien to have tackled just because of that thriller aspect – because uh, I think a lot of the German expressionism works great for this because of the, you know, the sharp angles and the darkness of mm. contrast on the f- facial features. It's like film noir, but before film noir. Mm-hmm. It's the well, it's the predecessor of the yeah. genre, right? It, it it fills in all of the th- trappings of what we eventually will get into what film noir is, right? I so. Agree. Um. Oh, there was something else I was going to just say, but uh, let's see. The filming. Um, Oh, I lost my thought. Sorry about that. No worries. It will come back to me. Do you know if it had to do with close-ups or just from stagnant shots or far away filming style? Oh, I remember it. Yes, it was, it was, uh, there was one scene where, and I don't remember what was wrong with him, I don't, I think it was exhaustion, and it was, he wasn't drunk, but it's commonly used in modern film for someone that's drunk, they blur the scene, but he did it in a very interesting way, in which the character in the forefront of the scene was in focus, and what he was looking at, like all the background became blurry. Oh, yes, and yes, I thought, yes. wow, that's very clever. That's, That's near funny. the uh, police station area where he's trying. He yeah. was uh, he he was summoned basically because his landlord is saying you're not paying. He owes a hundred something ruble or whatever it is, and so he needed to pay up. And then as he was leaving, he just basically felt faint and kind of just passed right. out. And they during that, back in again. Yeah, and there was a scene like you said, the camera. Uh, Intentionally uh, uh, obfuscate, obfuscates and makes blur some of the background. Yeah, yeah, it was plates. very cleverly done. I mean, yes. I was like, "Wow, that's exactly how it makes you feel." You know, it makes you feel like, yeah. "Oh my god, the guy's going to pass out." Yeah, and that's the beauty of this particular movie. Now, if we could only have seen a, a super clean print and clear yeah. print, 
I think we would see <laughs> some of these details. See, see a nice, a nice um, picture in focus, so you can yes. see out of focus clearly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing about film restoration. That's why it's critical and important that uh, older films like these get their their due of you know, right? You know, clean prints and cleaner picture quality so you can actually get get all of these full detailed information that you want it you know yeah so yeah i'm all for it film restoration that is yeah Mm. especially for this film being that it's such a widely known book i think maybe they i mean i'm sure i mean maybe they're in the process of cleaning it up somewhere in the world but just because it is kind of an important piece of literature i'm yeah. surprised they wouldn't want to mirror that to be like hey here's an equally important piece of film mm. but i'm sure people are like oh blah 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 it's not that important blah, <laughs> well blah, it has money, to do with budget always money. right yeah always has to do with how much money people can devote to do all this stuff it's expensive you know so so let's see the char- the main character Roscoe Roscovitz whatever his name is, uh, he uh, because of the distortion, it was really funny that his eyes were often just two glowing dots, and it made right. him look like a monster, like a vampire. And I thought yeah. it added in a way to the eeriness of the film because mm-hmm. he was because he wasn't in focus and you couldn't see his face clearly. He just kept reminding me of Lurch from the Adams family. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, a lot of uh, Robert Wings films basically have characters like from that. In a f- in fact, because Adam's Family came after, right? So mm-hmm. you could also say that they're influenced by films like oh, these. <laughs> I'm sure. So, I'm sure. So these type of makeup, these type of specific artistic choices that you know where they present. The the thing about like the German expressionism is like my favorite part in describing it is that you know the artist actually paints the shadow into the set. That's, right. that's my favorite part of the German expression. It's like, yes, you use dark, light and dark shadows with lighting and darkness and stuff like that in the film itself. But then my, one of my favorite parts is that they actually will paint the shadow into the sets. So as they're walking around, going around the corners, they're stepping onto shadows. Yeah. It's <laughs> emerging not a, from yeah, shadows. It's not a real you know? shadow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and um, speaking of Freaky, there was, um, as he was hallucinating, I was just passing out, sleeping at home or something like that, and as the guilty conscience of the murder is happening, there's the pawnbroker's face uh, was basically Multiples. duplicate. Oh, yeah, the multiple. Old woman. It, yeah, yeah, it was, was freaky. freaky. Yeah, it was freaky. Is the best. It's and it was duplicated just all over each frame of the the. I mean, it's commonplace nowadays, right? Like today. If you watch any thrillers, you'll, you'll actually not just thrillers, any movie, there's a technique you use where you, you, that's what you do. You, you show kind of the inner psychosis or struggle of the character and you kind of have to, uh, make sense of their thinking of their, uh, mm-hmm. either dream or daydream or thought process, right? Mm-hmm. About why this is, you know, done a certain way or not in that whole sort of, um, technique you know i mean this guy really did a number on it you know for this particular film film segment so you know know, a lot of a lot of um films when there's a murderer and uh the gimmick for the gimmick for lack of a better word they use um is that the murderer if he has a guilty conscience will continue to see the face of his victim yes all over the place like he'll, yes. he'll make he'll mistake continually mistake people for the victim yeah and it's sort of like a defense mechanism saying i didn't really do this like right. the person who isn't really dead um and it haunts them that's why they come up with this um you know the term like you're being haunted by the ghost of yes the victim. and i wonder if a lot of them are either consciously or unconsciously sort of paying homage to this director and directors like them because that's kind of the bread and butter of the whole generous uh, expressionism artistically 
even in, on the stage, like they they would stage a lot of theatrical presentations and they would often do something similar on the stage as well. They're simply taking, not simply, but they're transporting a lot of the artistic techniques on the stage into the film realm, right? So right. I found that interesting. Um, hmm. But I think, as, as, I said, as I said last week, I still feel like this director's, so far, his films that I've seen is kind of a one note not it, not that it's a bad thing but he he excels at you know stuff in the dark stuff with reality and dream state and uh basically sussing out and exploring the deepest darkest you know psyches of humanity and uh he continues to explore that here and i wish that more of his films were uh, available to us to to watch maybe he did like a romantic comedy we don't know <laughs> who knows right <laughs> I I wish that there was something that isn't just this sort of um, plot point or uh, motif or theme that he likes to to keep dwelling on. You know what I mean? But that's so yeah. far that's still his mo and um I, and uh, maybe like in the next I the the la- the next one that we'll we'll hopefully get to to watch is probably the, his last one that's available to us. Or not two, two, uh, probably one, uh, let's see, one, two more. There's probably two more that is available to us to watch. Uh, I N, uh, R I, which is about Jesus, and the other one is the the Night of the Rose. Um, that one seems pretty interesting. So I can't it would... see a tale of Jesus being done with the kind of sets he likes to do. Yeah, I know it's <laughs> it's really yeah, odd, right? I don't know how he's gonna do it. So let's be be interesting to see. Uh, but the final one that's available to us is a. Uh, it seems like a more cheerful story, and it's got a very interesting soundtrack to it too. Um, oh, that's another thing I was going to comment about this film is I hated the music. Oh yes, it was yes. very boastful. Yeah, and oh. I just want to say I N R I being that it's cheery. I'm just like that was on Jesus's cross. I don't know how it could be cheery, but yeah. we have to just see. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, isn't that like his you know oh no 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 life. not that movie <laughs> i was talking about the the one after one that one called the oh. night of the rose yeah so oh, he gotcha. there's a couple <laughs> more movies he's that's available to us one's a 1923 INR, and then the other one's called the night of the rose which is the the final film that i uh, as far as we know is available to us in uh 1925 or 26 hmm. that's kind of the last one and that one is a different plot point so anyways Looking forward to some of those when we get around to that. But other than that, uh, I would say due to the picture quality, I think it's really hard to discern uh, what the film in detail is about. But uh, we got the sort of the large plot points, I think. I just wish that we would be able to see some of the background, the sets and the designs clearly and some of the acting, stuff like that. But other than that, uh, even I would imagine, um, just using my imagination, if... We could even if we do all that, it's still kind of mid grade. It's I I still don't think it's as good as even like even Fear, you know, one of the first ones we saw, or even like uh, certainly like Caligari or In the Hands of Orlock. Those those are uh, still I think far superior works of film than than these ones. So so far. And what was that about Orlock? In the Hands of Orlock, yeah. So it's. Uh, is that the same character from Nosferatu? Different character. That oh. one's Orlek, or O R L E K, Count Orlek, and then this one's Orlock. Oh. oh, okay. O-R-L-A-K. Thank you for clarifying L-A-K. that because yeah. I thought you were talking about the same character, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's yeah, not a similar names. <laughs> yeah, it's not a, a tie-in. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. So, yeah. Of course, all these things references some. I bet either some local Germanic. You know, you know, Transylvania location or some reference point, I'm sure. I don't know what the detail is, but wouldn't surprise me if they actually reference something local to that uh, region. It wouldn't surprise me, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, back to the movie. I just, uh, that's my thoughts about it. Uh, I don't really have anything else to add except that, you know, his actual technique, his direct sort of uh, technical expertise is still on display here and he's still going for the same themes as I noted last time that we reviewed his movie. And so 
that's pretty much all I have. Do you guys have any sort of parting thoughts about this particular movie? I would say overall, I, I think it's worth watching. Would... In spite of the fact that it's terrible quality and terrible music, it's still <laughs> until if you if you like if you like um, thinking about a good display of you know the guilt <laughs> that someone might feel for committing a murder. That's it's a really good display of that. I think. Yeah, it's kind of like an extrapolation of that novel, uh, the the crime and punishment novel. It it, it definitely distills a, a lot of the major themes from that book. It, that, that that is part of the book movie. Yeah. So, having not read the book, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's a long book. <laughs> he doesn't write short books. <laughs> Sorry, Lily, if I talked over you there. Oh, uh, it's okay. I was just like better version. Someone, yeah. anyone. <laughs> um, I don't really know much to say about this. It, it. I guess if there was, how many remakes do we know? At least twenty three, twenty five. Oh yeah. my gosh! Okay, twenty five <laughs> adaptations of Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say amongst all of those, I mean, one of them's got to have another, you know, defiable psychosis of the psyche. <laughs> you know, just to understand it a little better, you know, you go from the 1923 version to the the next updated version. I don't know if that came out in the 40s or something, but it just be good to see the next. I actually, step I'm, ahead. I was mistaken earlier. I'm going to correct myself. Is uh, 1909 a- another film Russian film director beat him to the punch? So. 1909, they already did adaptation for Crime and Punishment by a wow. director called V. Gon Charvov. <laughs> wow. And there's another one after. Actually, there's three adaptations 1909, 1913, 1915, all Russian films, which I bet all lost. So um, mm. then the US did a, a silent one too in 1917. So it's heavily uh, adapted over the years. Yeah. Hmm. Everyone, everyone must accept that Crime and Punishment is a good book. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was your parting thoughts, uh, Lily? Sorry, I interrupted you. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe just seeing the most up, uh, comparing that version, like the Elvis version this version, maybe the next updated version in the most recent. Because I would think maybe Hollywood might not have distorted it as much for the next version of Crime and Punishment. Is that... Wait, no. Crime and... Yeah, it's Crime and Punishment. (laughs) I was thinking of War and Peace again. I was like, wait, this is that one. Um, And then just compare it to the most updated version, because I'm sure Hollywood has twisted some things to make it Mm. more about the romance and, (laughs) you know, the sex appeal of the actors and blah, blah, blah. Yep. The the romance wasn't overdone in this movie, that's for sure. No. (laughs) You don't even know if there was romance. Who knows? (laughs) It it seems like uh, is. I, I haven't tallied this up in the Excel spreadsheet or anything, but it seems like there's a lot. There was a. There had been out of the 25, mo- majority of the adaptations are actually European slash Eurasian, like you know Russians and and uh, Eastern uh, European adaptations. Hmm. Far outnumber the the what we, we would de- what we would think is the Hollywood adaptations. There's only been a handful over the years of the what we would think call our Hollywood adaptations. The rest of them are actually by either European or Russian or some other countries. I think there was even a, a Japanese film adapting this, this mm. story too. Anyways, this is a very interesting. It's It's been it's a global phenomenon. So it's, you know, when it doesn't surprise me that it's, it's had several multiple adaptations over the years. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Anywho, 
All right, so that's pretty much it for us today. Um, if, do you guys have any parting thoughts in general? <laughs> can we watch a silent film that we can actually visually see? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. That would be... Uh... The artist. <laughs> Look, shapes yeah. in green. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, now it's shapes in blue. <laughs> Yes. I see eyes there. There are eyes on that face. <laughs> yeah. It's like me trying to describe a cus <laughs> It's a lady with the eyes. Yep. Anywho, so that concludes the podcast for today. So um you can find more of our stuff at watching silentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's uh watching silentfilms.wordpress.com. And send us an email at watching silent films plural at gmail.com with thoughts, comments, ideas, and uh you please uh leave a review at the podcast or any platform you, you get the podcast from. And uh and uh if if you wouldn't mind um putting a good star rating or review in that, it helps other um film lovers come and find us as well. So thank you listeners, thanks Bob and Lily, and uh we'll chat again next time. And this episode is uh produced by Lily and edited by Yvonne. Thank you. Have a good night.